So today, I want to continue, all right? You hear that word continue. I think some of you will know where I'm going. Uh, we've been talking about providence and the sovereignty of God over the past few weeks, and today, today I want to take this from a different angle. I, I, I want us to look at the extent of God's providence and sovereignty. I may not use the word sovereignty uh, every time I mention providence, but you know, keep it in the back of your mind that that's what I'm, I'm meaning as well. But I want us to look at the extent of God's providence and sovereignty at work in our lives. At work in your life, you personally. And I think the best that we could define, and, and that would be all-inclusive, by the way, of God's providence and His sovereignty would be in all the good and bad of life. In all the, for, for lack, I guess, of a, a deeper and more theological uh, definition to that. Uh, and, and of course, the Christian, the Christian perspective is that all that God will do and allows is good. Now, I want you to think about your worst day. I want you to think about your worst situation, even now. As my brother mentioned, um, our brother and sister Joel and Susan he mentioned himself and what they're going through. And, and the Christian has to resign to the fact that God's providence, God's sovereignty is working even in those situations that we do not understand Amen. or even like at times. But we do know as Christians that all that God will do and what he allows is good. It is good because it's working something in our life. For it is that, that God has allowed affliction in your life, maybe. You can identify with that or the life of someone you love. Paul reminds us as Christians now, he's speaking to the church in, in Corinth, and we read in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 to 18, this light, momentary affliction. <laughs> you might think, light? And momentary. Momentary, I want to grab onto. Light? Um, no. This light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, Paul says. Whatever is going on in your life, whatever trial or testing of your faith God has brought into your life, do not be so quick as to go to your knees and asking God to remove this situation, but ask God to allow you to understand His work and, and to embrace what God is doing because it's not working a temporal situation in your life. It's working an eternal glory in your life. Amen. He goes on to say that it's beyond all comparison. What can you compare eternal things with in this life? Hardly nothing. Nothing. It's beyond all comparison because he says, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. To the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That is where the Christian will rest. That is where you will find comfort. That is where you will find your joy. That is where you will find your peace. And it is in fellowship. It is a, in a consistent and constant relationship with Jesus Christ daily. It's not compartmentalized. It can't be once a month, once every other week, or whatever. Our relationship with Jesus Christ must be 24-7, 365 days a year. Because there's a work going on in your life as a Christian to prepare you for that eternal dwelling. And we need to get it. We need to get it. Remember Job's words to his wife and speaking about God's providence and sovereignty. Job chapter 2 and verse 10, his grief-stricken wife. Now remember, this woman had lost all of her children. They just lost all of their wealth. And she, 
And, and I, I think it would be wrong for us to think that she would mean it maliciously by saying to her husband, Job, just curse God and die. Just, just re resign yourself to, to fate here and give up and die. And he says to her, you talk as some of the foolish women. And that wasn't an insult against the woman movement of our world. What he was saying was, you don't have the mind of God. You don't see things as God sees things. And, and Job asked her, he says, shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? They're both a blessing intended by God. The good and the bad. Oftentimes we just want to land on the good and say, oh, it's wonderful to be on the mountaintop with Jesus. To be on the mountaintop with the Lord. But when he descends us into the valley, sometimes we want to feel, God doesn't care. I'm forsaken. I'm troubled. I'm full of woes. It's because you lack understanding in what God's Word teaches us. I'm not saying there won't be moments in your life where nothing will make sense because of the grief. <clears throat> we still deal with this human nature, don't we? We won't be perfected until we are glorified with the Lord. And I'm not saying that when we lose a loved one or a child, that that grief will just not pierce you to your being. But in all of it, as the Lord moves us through those things, moves you through those things, you'll give glory to the Lord. Because God providentially is in control. And he has the power to do so. Turn with me, if you would, way back. You already Ecclesiastes this morning. You know, Carol begins here in Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die. Hmm. You'll know why I picked that in just a few moments. Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. We're talking about the extent of God's providence and sovereignty in your life. In your life. Chapter 16, beginning with verse 1. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Amen. The Lord has made everything for its purpose. Listen to this. Even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. An antidote for, against evil is the fear of the Lord, right? When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Amen. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. And this is, we'll stop here at verse 9. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Oh, let's pray. Father, sometimes I don't even know what I'm doing. But I do know, Lord, that you, you do know what you are doing. You have a purpose and a plan. Father, I have notes in front of me, things you've taught me this week, laid on my heart. But Father, only you can communicate your word of truth to the hearts that are here this morning, to those who are listening. And Father, my desire is to glorify your name, Lord, that we would be a little closer to you in this moment in our time together as we reflect upon your truth. Oh, Father, I ask that you would just continue to have your way here in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> One of the key, the key
key verse here that we're going to be talking about is verse 9. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Now, last week we talked a little bit about the boundaries of freedom in God's sovereignty and God's providence. You know, I remember I gave you the illustration by Tony Evans that uh, God allows us freedom. God allows you and I to have freedom of making a decision within the boundaries of His providence and sovereignty. And if, if, if God did not give us that freedom of the will, let me throw that in there, then we could not stand before God and be held accountable for the decisions and choices we make. Didn't Paul say that we are to be careful how we build upon the foundation that has been laid in Jesus Christ? Did he not say that? We need to be careful because he said some will build with wood, hay, and stubble, and in the day of judgment, all of those things will be burned up. But he encourages us to build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ with precious stones, gold, and silver. That in the day of trying, in the day of testing, they will withstand the trial, the test. The works will glorify God. So we live within the boundary of God's freedom. We Remember a few weeks ago I, I, we talked about coming to a point of decision where people will either choose life or choose death. So I want you to keep that in mind as well, the freedom that we have. Um, I, I want to remind you as we go along here what providence and sovereignty mean. And providence may be defined as that continued exercise of the divine energy whereby the Creator, number one, preserves all His creatures, Number two is operative in, in all that comes to pass in the world. And number three directs all things to their appointed end. Even your life. Right? Nothing is going to happen in your life that God has not already preordained and will allow. Whether you agree with it or not. God will have his way. Sovereignty. I wrote, God as owner exercises sovereign, supreme, absolute rule and authority over all his creation to do as he wills. To do as he wills. And this speaks clearly of God's omnipotence. His, he is all-powerful. His, his omnipresence. God is present everywhere, all around the world at the same time, yet he pays attention to you individually. Talk about the omnipresence of God. That kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. He can be everywhere at once, yet he's right here talking to me personally or you personally. And he is omniscient. God knows everything. Because he created knowledge. God knows everything. He knows things that we will never know. He knows all things. And he knows all things thoroughly. He, he's got it right down. Even about your life. That he has the hairs of your head even numbered. <laughs> Job 42 and 2 says. I know that you can do all things. in speaking of God. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job says, whatever God you have purposed, nothing is going to derail it. You will not digress from your purpose and your will. It will be accomplished. We either move with the kingdom or we are out of the kingdom. Christians move with the advancing of the kingdom. The unregenerate do not. The unsaved do not. So sovereignty, we can say, is God's absolute right. His power to do as he would please. It is God who works in you, Christian, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. You know, when we understand providence as Christians, when we under, begin under, to understand the sovereignty of God, we understand that God is a creator and sustainer of all his creation. We, we've talked about that in the past. It's a good reminder, though. God is a created, creator and sustainer of every human being. Saved and unsaved. You mean God cares about what the sinner does? Absolutely he cares. You know, 
God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the Bible says. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked because he knows their end. How well and how pleasant it is. The Bible says even of those who, the righteous who die. So what is the extent of God's providence? We've read here in Proverbs 16 and verse 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. In the Amplified Bible, <clears throat> it says it like this, a man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps and makes them sure. Now I want you to think about your life for a moment. I want you to think back over your life. Of all the, the things that you would say were bad decisions, mistakes, and sinful events and times in your life. And look at where you are today. Okay, we're going to be talking about this in more detail in a few minute, moments, but I want you to see God's detail even in your life. The extent of God's providence at work in your life, even back when, back when, before you came to Christ, God was leading you to Christ, to that point through calling and election, bringing you to the cross. God's divine providence extends. I'm going to tell you, give you ten things here, and I'm going to go through them quickly because I'm going to land right back on the, the one I'm going to focus on for the rest of this service. I know you're thinking quickly. Yeah, right. I'm going to, okay? And I'm going to back it up with at least one verse of Scripture. God's divine providence extends, number one, over the, the entire universe at large. Remember Nebuchadnezzar when he had been cursed by God for a season, uh, seven seasons it says, however long that was, and he became kind of a, an insane man, right? And in Daniel 4.35, Nebuchadnezzar says, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he's speaking of God now. And he, he does according to his will. This is Nebuchadnezzar acknowledging Almighty God. He says, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? What have you done? Why God? Does the clay say to the potter, why did you make me like this? Secondly, God's divine providence extends over the entire physical world. In Psalm 135 and 6, it says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deep. The divine providence of God extends over the affairs of nations. Psalms 22 and 28 says, For kingship belongs to the Lord, and He rules over the nations. In Acts 17, 26, Paul in ministering to the men at Ar the Aragopis, uh, the men of Mars Hills, the Athenians, he says, and he made, made from one man, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the, the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling. Speaking about God's providence, the extent of, the extent of God's providence. God's divine providence extends over man's birth and lot in life. Number four, that is God providentially overrules the time of our birth, the place of our birth, the nature of our birth, and our lot in life. Psalm 139, David says in verse 16, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. He had, he had kind of a grasp on the providence of God, didn't he? It, before I was born, you wrote the days of my life. Every one of them complete, you wrote them. You see, you can look at yourself, you can, you can apply this to yourself. God knew you. God knew you, God designed you, God designed everything about you right down to your DNA. Everything about you. God allowed you to be born into the family that you were born into. 
And that should be comfort to you, by the way. God didn't make a mistake with you. He didn't get it wrong. I remember as a kid, my mother would always say, yeah, David always wanted to be an only child. And I did at one point because I was so selfish and greedy. I thought that, that uh, single children, families, got everything. <laughs> you see, my sin nature was pretty, pretty um, visual then, wasn't it? Huh? huh? And I'm no different than you. You know it. God's providence extends, number five, over all of our outward successes and failures. Over all of our outward successes and failures. Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7 says, For not from the east or from the west, and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. God's Providence extends over things, number six, seemingly accidental or insignificant. Over things seemingly accidental or insignificant. In Proverbs 6, 33, the law is cast into the lap, but its every decision is of the Lord. And as I've said earlier, Matthew 10, 30, the, even, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Nothing is accidental, nothing is insignificant. God's providence extends to the protection of the righteous. To the protection of the righteous. In Psalm 5 and 12, it says, For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as a shield. Isn't that nice? Huh? God's providence extends in supplying the wants and needs of his people. In Genesis 22 and verse 8, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Abraham had taken his one and only son, well, not one and only, the promised son, Isaac. God told him to take him to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. And they were on their journey. They had the fire, they had the wood, and little Isaac, or, you know, maybe some say he was around in his 20s when this happened. We don't know, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But it says that he, he said, Father, we have the fire, we have the wood, but um, where, where's the sacrifice? <clears throat> And Abraham says to him, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Man, does that reach far. In Philippians 4 and verse 19, <clears throat> we are encouraged at the fact that God, Paul says, will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Number nine. God's divine providence extends in giving answers to prayer. In giving answers to prayer. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. It calls us to, to some, some specific things here. But it's all in God's divine providence. And last, number 10, God's divine providence extends in the exposure of and punishment of the wicked. The exposure and punishment of the wicked. It tells us again in Psalm 7, verses 12 and 13, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He, speaking of God, is bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Hmm. Again, it tells us in Psalm 11 and verse 6, let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. God warns us in Scripture that today is the day of salvation. Today God has come to meet us and that we must repent of our sins when God prompts the heart to salvation, make the decision to choose Jesus Christ. Because there is a consequence in not coming to Him. And it's a, you know, as I was thinking about the news that we received this week um, with my wife's sister's friend, how grievous it is, how grievous it is uh, to lose someone you're close to and so seemingly young and you know, death is hard at any age. It really is, isn't it? 
And yet we are reminded in Scripture of the brevity of life. Life is very short. We're not promised the rest of this day or tomorrow, next week, month, next year. We're only given right now, right now, today. And so we pray for the unsaved. We pray that they would come to Christ. Come to Him. So I want to talk to you for just a few more minutes on the extent of God's providence as He overrules the time and the place of our birth and our lot in life. Uh, and, and we talked a few moments ago as we look over the landscape of our lives, and we can only do that looking back, right? We can only do that from this point back, looking back over the landscape of our lives. As we do that, to understand God's providence and His sovereignty is to know that the backdrop of our lives is God. The backdrop of our lives is God. In your life, even in your lostness, even in your sinful state, to the saved and the unsaved, the backdrop of our lives is God. God is at work. God is at work because of the cross reaching people for salvation. Calling to people to come to Christ. Allowing situations and, and circumstance in the lives of individuals that will eventually lead them to that point of calling and response. Where they will make a decision for or against. Does God know? Yes, God knows. God knows, but he allows us that opportunity, doesn't he? James asks the question, what is your life? What is your life? He would have us to take into consideration our lives. He says that, 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 that he reminds us that our lives on this earth are, are very, very, very brief. He, he compares our lives to a mist that appears for a little time and then is gone. It's like the vapor coming out of the, the teapot on the stove, right? That mist comes out and it just is gone so fast. And in light of eternity, in light, we can't even compare this life. This, whether we live to be one year old or whether we live to be 120 years old, it's very, very brief in light of eternity. Amen. So what is your life? What is the extent of God's providence in your life, in our lives today? David, the psalmist, says us, For man his days are like grass. In Psalm 103, He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. <laughs> you know what that's saying? You live a very brief life, and when death comes to you, your, even the place of your existence will at one point in time be forgotten. Isn't that good news? Yeah, I thought it would encourage you. Huh? And his place knows it no more. By God's grace. By God's grace and only by God's grace, we have been a, allotted a determined and specific period of time in this earthly life. A determined and specific time each and every one of us have been given. As Christians, we are to make the most of our time. We're not to waste time. We're to use time wisely. This is achieved. How is this achieved? It's achieved knowing and living in obedience to the commands of Christ. Knowing and living in obedience to His words. We, we are to always and everything as Christians now Bring glory to God. We're to bring glory to God in our everyday living. We're to bring glory to God in our everyday relationships. Be it with our spouses, with our children, with those we work with, with those we come in contact with. We are to bring glory to Christ. How in the world do we do that? Through a life of devotion to God. Devotion, by devotion I mean time that we will spend with God in communion with God, in God's Word, reading God's Word, studying God's Word, memorizing or meditating upon God's Word. In prayer, spending time in prayer, in that communion with God. All of these things, devotion, true devotion in your life, will result in bringing glory to Jesus Christ. And you know, that, that needs to be a constant 
in the life of God's people. It needs to be a constant in our lives. For those of you who have a devotional life, I pray all of you do. If you don't, you should. And that's not from me, that's from the Word. You should. If you've been in the Word, if you've been in prayer, and that's, that habit has been formed in your life, and then all of a sudden something happens, and, and why well, you, you, don't, you, you don't get to do that for a day or so. I call that the gaps we encounter in life. The gaps we encounter. Some are avoidable, some are not. Sometimes we create our own gaps through our disobedience to God. And we know what it means if, if you understand what I'm saying when I say you, you encounter that gap. You feel it. You feel it in your heart. You feel it in your life. Something is missing. Something is not hitting. Hitting. Man, G sound. And there's only one result for that. You go to God. You go to God. You see, our devotion to God not only glorifies God, but it brings about a change in our lives. There's a change in our lives. A few weeks ago, we talked about the fruits of repentance. We talked about doing what is right and, and the wisdom we pray for from above and, and all of those things. And, and the fruit of the Spirit we read about in Galatians chapter 5. When we have a life of devotion... That consistent and constant lifestyle of serving the Lord, we will bear fruit for the kingdom. And Jesus says in John chapter 15, which we probably know well, that if you begin to bear fruit, God's going to come along and prune you. Huh? For one purpose and one purpose only that you would bear more fruit. Much more. In abundance. That's right. You see, as Christians, the constant devotion says, I've been with the Lord. The constant devotion says, I'm walking with Christ. But what, what does it say over here? Let me, let me go here. Let me go here. Chapter 5, Ephesians 5. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let me ask you this. And I, and this isn't in my notes or anything, right? Is your life a fragrant offering to God? My sister-in-law said to me a, a couple of weeks ago when I came out of the office, she said, there's a jet stream of cologne when you go by. <laughs> you know, you put that cologne on and People smell that cologne, or you ladies use your perfume. You want people to smell that fragrant aroma, right? Is your life a sweet and fragrant aroma before God? That others too can experience that. That others too may see that, know that. Maybe they may not understand it. But it may be something of your testimony that would encourage somebody to want what you have. Or it may be, you may never even know about it. And God may be using, because of your devotion, using your testimony to point others to Christ. And you may never know anything about it. Because God in you, a life of devotion, God in you is making his appeal to the world around you. Paul told the Corinthians. God making his appeal. You think you have to have the right tracks in your pocket and a Bible that weighs 10 pounds and go out and witness to somebody. No, God is saying devotion says I am a walking testimony of Jesus Christ. Is your life a fragrant aroma that testifies of the goodness of God? You see, God's, the extent of God's providence and sovereignty in your life says that's where you need to get to. You need to get there. I need to get there. I need to live there. And if I live anything in this Christian life, aside from all of these wonderful virtues and attributes of God and the fruit of the Spirit, 
I am living in an anti-testimony to Christ. And you know, and this is something, this is an area of the church that we need to pay attention to. Amen. We want to cry out, the Lord is my Savior. I'd rather have you live it. I know if I say that, I mean, I mean totally the opposite of that in compared to Christ. The word says, that's what we are to do. Because as Christians, the extent of God's divine providence and his sovereignty at work in our life is constantly building grace upon grace upon grace. And we are to be that fragrant aroma of Jesus Christ. And when we encounter the gaps in our relationship, oh, we sense a lacking there, don't we? So we are to walk in love, be imitators of God as beloved children, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know what the sac your sacrifice to God is? Uh, don't answer that out loud. I'm, I'm asking you that to, to, to make you think for a moment, okay? Paul pleaded. He pleaded with the saints at Rome. In Romans 12, <clears throat> verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren. That word appeal means he spent some time on that. He spent some time with them. He wanted them to fully understand. This is one of those Jesus truly, truly moments. Okay, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship or your reasonable service to God. Do not be conformed to this. Oh, there you go, right there. You see, as Christians, the divine providence of God extended in our lives, the reach of it in our lives, says that we have no conformity to this world. We have no likeness anymore to this world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. If I walked out of here today, Got down in the parking lot and started talking to you and started to use some profanity. Ooh. Or telling a dirty joke. <laughs> I wouldn't need you to tell me how wrong I am. What, what, what would it remind you of? It would remind you that, hey, no, 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 no. We don't talk like that. We don't talk like that. What if you saw me out on the highway tomorrow? You saw me in a road rage. Huh? Huh? Well, I would just say, well, you know, you know, that's, that's just, you know, well, you know, they cut me off. There's no excuses. Is there? What I'm saying is, a fragrant aroma and sacrifice to God has no conformity to the world whatsoever. You know, the battle is hard enough as Christians to maintain the steady in following Christ without, without adding to the problem. And trust me, we can all add to the problem without any effort. So the, the extent of God's divine providence at work in our lives brings us to the place of being a living sacrifice, holy acceptable. It is spiritual worship. It is our spiritual service to God. It is our, what we are called to do. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, Romans 12, 2, by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is the will of God? That good, that acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's not talking about three different wills of God either. 
Okay. That's talking about one and the same will of God. It's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. There's nothing less than the, the, the divine will of God. You know, if, if, if God was saying, okay, well, there's the good will, there's the acceptable will, and then there's the perfect will, okay? How many of us would be just satisfied with the good? Yeah, most of us. Most of us would say, okay, I'm going to just barely make it through. I used to go through school like that. I just, hey, if I got a D, hey, it's passing, right? Oh, just get by. No, no, no. God calls us to the good, the, accept, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God because God's divine providence is working in your life, leading us, guiding us, helping us, aligning us to his perfect will. Not only in our devotion, not only in our outward testimony, in our prayer life, he tells us in Romans 8, 26, 27, doesn't he? about how we are to align with the will of God, the Holy Spirit comes, the, the divine power of God in you, the Holy Spirit in you. It's leading us into prayer to pray the will of God. You know, I have to be honest with you about something when it comes to prayer. And there's a lot of people to be praying for, a lot of situations to pray for. And there's, there are some times when I go before the Lord in prayer, and after praying and praying, I'll use my, my wife for an, an example. Um, you know that she, she broke her back in 1998, severely, falling off a horse. You know, I don't know why I went and bought that big Belgian workhorse. You know, she's from Tennessee. I thought all of them knew how to ride horses. <laughs> you know, good grief. But no, she fell. It was an accident. And uh, we prayed. We prayed for 23 years for her healing. But it, we, we, I got to the point, she got to the point as well. And then, of course, just two years ago, uh, it was damaged again. And it was through that damage that was done, though, that we found something else out, that she has severe advanced osteoporosis. She had it worse than her mother. And so it, I got to a point, my wife and I got to the point in prayer where we were no longer praying, Lord, heal. Okay, Lord, we surrender. How is it you want us to view this? Because we know, God, that in your providence, in your sovereignty, you can heal in a moment. You can make whole in a moment. You can raise the dead back to life. Certainly you can heal a broken back. Certainly you can heal a severed spine in an accident. Yes, God can. God doesn't all the time because he has a bigger picture than we do. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So we must learn in understanding God's, the extent of God's providence, how to pray. So we pray, Lord, be glorified in this. Be glorified in this. You know, we were talking about it a few days ago, and I said, you know, had you not had your back fractured again two years ago, we, we, we wouldn't have known the severity of the osteoporosis. So in the bad, in that moment of bad, and trust me, I wanted to retaliate in that. God's providence stands. We may not like it all the time. God doesn't care if you like it or not. He didn't consult you in the decision. God has a bigger plan for your life, for the life of his church, corporately and individually. And we must surrender to that. So we pray. We pray, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Yeah, I, I used to pray. Lord, I'll trade places with her. The Lord said, you would be a bigger wimp. <laughs> <laughs> you would moan and cry all the time. <laughs> and he's right. I would. <laughs> oh, listen. David says in Psalm 31 and 15, I've said it already, I'm wrapping up. My times are in your hand. Do you believe that? You know, Al, you asked us if we believed. Is he our all? Is he our everything? When you understand as a Christian, 
God's divine providence over your life, you can say, yes, he is my everything. Yes, he is all I need in all of life. Everything. I can trust him. Even though the situation looks dark, even though it looks bleak, even though there's pain in the journey, I can trust that God has already ordained this and that God has the power to see it through because he is the sustainer of all his creation. That's who God is. And God can handle your life. God can handle your situation. You know, David is such an example for us, isn't he? Of success and failure and success again. Maybe that's your life story. You see, there's nothing of your sinful past that you can go back and change and looking back over the landscape of your life, nothing. You, you can't go back and change a thing. Uh, we cannot reverse time, can we? How many times have we seen a tragic situation where people cried out, if I'd only been a few seconds earlier or later, if I could only go back and tell them. We can't go back, can we? Can we? All the sin, all the sin of which you were, and I were born into and committed, the shame, the regret, the bad decisions and choices, nothing. We, we can't change anything. We can't go back. However, God's divine providence says, you see, he says this, before you were even born, before, before you were conceived, before you came into this life, before the foundation of the world, God did something with your past in Christ. Now think about that. Before you were even born, God did something about your past. Your past of sin and shame and regret and bad choices. God did something about it at the cross. Whoever believes in him, we, we receive eternal life, the forgiveness of sins. Blessed is he, David says, whose sins are forgiven, whose transgressions have been covered. Blessed is he. Jesus did something about your sin and my sin, the sin of the world, at the cross for those who come to him. Is it any wonder we, we preach the salvation gospel, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting. eternal or everlasting life. Eternal weight of glory. <clears throat> the extent of God's providence through the cross calls to the lost of this world to come to Christ. What a plan of salvation. What a plan it is. He extends the call of salvation to every human being. The universal call to salvation. The universal call to salvation. However, here's the truth. A joyous truth, but a grievous truth at the same time. Only a few will receive it. Only a few will receive it. The gift of eternal life. Jesus said that the gate is narrow and the way is very straight that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Because people are so satisfied in following the culture of our time, the conformities of our culture, and going into the broad gate that leads to destruction. Only a few will find it. So as a child of God, when we understand the, the divine providence of God and His sovereignty... We can rejoice and praise and worship the Lord that he chose you. Oh, there's so much more, I could say. So much more. Hmm. Well, I, I want to say that I'm probably going to pick up somewhere else next week, but I, I don't know. I'm just as sure as I say that, we'll be right back here again. And, and it's like I said, it wasn't up to me. This was a, this was a challenge this morning um, with this message. When the computer goes down and the printer won't print. 
Um, and I was out here trying to fire it up and looking at it, and it was, it was just blank. Nothing's coming up. And it's like, okay, Lord, I've got it. I understand. You have a plan. Because God does have a plan, doesn't he? God has a plan for each and every one of us. And he will work all things according to the counsel of his will in our life. Yes, he will. If we trust him, I dare you to trust him. Trust him, church. Trust him. Look to the Lord. Look for his hope. Amen? Amen.